Our norms are a promise that we will not allow this department to be used as a political weapon. And our norms are a promise that we will not allow this nation to become a country where law enforcement is treated as an apparatus of politics. Honestly, it's hard not to laugh at that. I mean, that is our Attorney General of the United States talking. That's Attorney General Merrick Garland denying that his Department of Justice has ever been used as a political weapon, despite many examples of two-tier justice practice during the Biden-Harris administration. Joining us now is Victor Davis Hanson, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, Victor, I just don't know where to start. I mean, you could, you could start with the Mar-a-Lago raid, uh, which was something that had never been done to a former president before. That was, that was pretty outrageous. Then you had the attacks on parents defending their kids at PTA meetings, an arm raid, or several armed raids of uh, pro-life activists. And, and I want to start, though, with, I think, the most significant, which is when we saw the number three man at the Department of Justice, a guy named Colangelo, go down to New York, that's Colangelo on the left, for Alan Bragg's lawsuit against a former president who was challenging the current president of the United States. It was a very political local court prosecution uh, based on an uncharged expired misdemeanor that miraculously turned into 34 felonies. That was all allowed by the judge on the right, Mershon. Uh, is, is that now the normal of American justice? Because that ain't justice. Yeah, I mean, if Merrick Garland really believes that, all he has to do is cite one more example of the top, any of the top three or four or five federal attorneys in the DOJ of the, in New York going and being outsourced or resigning and taking a lesser uh, compensated job at a local prosecutor's office. That doesn't happen in California, it doesn't happen in Utah, it doesn't happen anywhere in the United States. So all he has to do is say, we have a very top high-ranking justice official who chose to, you know, step down and go to Mississippi or Wyoming or New Mexico to help out on a municipal uh, prosecution. And he can't do that. And he knows why he can't do that. We have Fannie Willis. Remember Nathan Wade, her paramour? He met twice with White House a, a legal counsel, yep. once in the White House, and yep. shamelessly he, yep. he billed them for the hours that he met. Then we had Jack Smith in 2023 who was investigated for meeting with White House aides, the federal uh, prosecutor. Then we had Joe Biden in 2022 kind of walking around muttering to himself, when are they going to go after Trump? And of course, there were a lot of people who said Jack Smith had no federal statute, the special prosecutor legislation had expired, and no one in the Congress had authorized that special counsel appointment. So, and then I could finish off with, remember Reed Hoffman, the big billionaire oh, who sure. uh, donates lavishly to the Biden campaign? He, he funded the entire E. Jean Carroll civil suit that ended up costing Trump supposedly $73 million. So yeah. that's all it has been is lawfare against a political enemy on the part of Merrick Garland. If Donald Trump is elected president again, how would he go about uh, fixing things at Department of Justice? And we haven't even begun to talk about Homeland Security either. I mean, that's a, there's so many of these bureaucracies, but the, the most important one, I think, is Department of Justice. How would he be able to untangle that web there? I, I think he's going to have to look at all the political appointments and ask for their resignations. And then, and I think they know that. And I think they're, they're preemptively uh, criticizing Trump because they know that if they were Trump and they had done to themselves what they have done to Trump, they would go after it themselves. And they're projecting. But uh, if he doesn't do that, he'll never restore deterrence. He's got to say to the nation, these people misuse law. I don't like political appointments on my, my own behalf, but I don't know how to remind them that uh, what they did was wrong other than to relieve the, all of these political appointments and start from scratch. Yeah. And I think he, he's going to have to do that. Yeah, what I, was wrong with the last administration is he, he didn't do that enough with uh, political no, appointments. No, he didn't. I, I think he thought he'd have another term to, to finish the job. But I want to switch to your, your analysis of the debate was spot on. You had the best analysis of the debate that I'd seen. But uh, even Democrats or some Democrats 
a very few, I, I have to admit, but Mark Penn was on a, a broadcast with John Solomon, I think it was a podcast, and he's a Democrat pollster. Here's what he had to say about the way the debate was handled by ABC and what should be done about that. Roll tape. I actually think they should do a full internal investigation, hire an outside law firm. I don't know how much of this was planned in advance. I don't know what they told the Harris campaign. Uh, I think they're, that, that, that the day after uh, suspicion here is really quite high. And, and I think that uh, I, I think a review of all their internal texts and emails might, might re it really should be done by an independent party to find out to what extent they were planning on, on, a, on in effect, you know, fact checking just one candidate and in effect rigging the outcome of this debate. And I, I, I think I think the situation demands nothing less than that. Well, I, I have to be honest. I don't think that's going to happen. I've, I've been around these networks for, for many a decade, and, and I've never seen them do a switcheroo that dramatically. However, if Mark Penn, a Democrat pollster, is saying that, and he's kind of middle of the road Democrat, there aren't many of them left, but if he's saying that, what about all those independents who watch that? Do you think they are having another think about what actually happened during that debate? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's why the Democrats are asking for another de debate, because in the digestion period of the subsequent 72 hours, people looked at that debate in, in, through different lenses, and they started to look at the sound bites, and they started to remember the asymmetrical questioning, mm -hmm. the asymmetrical fact-checking, the, the interruption of the tempo of Trump, uh, the direction of demanded follow-ups to Trump, no follow-ups. And, on, and then the questions themselves were softballs to her. Everybody understood that. And their narrative has changed, too. After, right after the debate, they were high-fiving each other and said, we finally fact-checked Trump. And then now, finally, uh, Ms. Davis is on the defensive and saying, well, we had to because of what happened with Biden. And that was kind of gave, gave the game away. And now I think they're in the defensive mode and they're kind of apologetic or they're silent at least, but they know what they did. They, I think the worst was they, they ruined the tempo of the debate. As someone who's debated a long time, it's very easy to, to remedy this. You just go by the Oxford Cambridge rules of debate. Statement, statement, rebuttal, rebuttal, counter rebuttal, counter rebuttal. Right. No right. moderator at all other than just a timekeeper. And they don't want to do that. All right, Victor, we got to leave it at why. that. I wanted to ask you about Kamala's flip flopping, but that'll have to wait for another time. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you very much. I hope the, uh, the almond Thank crop you. is better in, in California this year.